Okay, let's just give it a couple of minutes for people to join. Just give it one more minute, Nick. Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the Berman Institute of Bioethics seminar series of 2022-2023. Um, it's a pleasure to see people joining online. Uh, my name is Jess Fonzo. I am a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Food Policy at the Berman Institute, as well as the School of Advanced International Studies at Hopkins. And it is my great pleasure to uh, invite and to have and host uh, Nick Nisbet here with us today. Nick is a, prof a professorial fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in England and a professor of global public policy, nutrition, and health equity at the University of Sussex. Nick has over 20 years of international development research and policy development experience, and he has published and worked extensively on food and nutrition policy and politics. His recent work has focused on nutrition equity in that he co-chaired the introductory chapter to the very prominent, very influential 2020 Global Nutrition Report and is currently a member of the United Nations Committee on Food Security's high-level panel of experts for a report on inequalities in food systems that will be coming out later in the year. He has consulted with a range of international organizations, including UNICEF, the UK's DFID, with evaluations and research focusing on equity, national and community level drivers of nutrition and community accountability in India, Bangladesh, and West Africa. Prior to coming to the Institute of Development Studies, also known as IDS, Nick led UK government teams on agricultural trade policy, agricultural policy reform, and land and marine based natural resource management in a major international policy research program on the future of food and farming. I know Nick, I've known Nick for a while now. It's, uh, we've had nice collaborations in the past and I of course look forward to many more. He's a wonderful human being, thinker, and has really influenced the nutrition field tremendously, particularly his work on equity issues and nutrition policy. Thanks for joining us today, Nick, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jess, and thanks for such kind words in introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking about towards an infrastructure of nurture, what new thinking on infrastructure means for nutrition equity and food justice. Um, so I'm going to be looking at nutrition from the perspectives of nurture, care, infrastructure, equity and justice. And I'm beginning the presentation today by looking at definitions of care and nurture, but particularly on work on care that comes from social sciences. Um, I'm going to move from there to looking at what's been turned, what's been called the infrastructural turn in social sciences. Um, although separated by several decades, in some cases, these two literatures on care and on infrastructure have reached some very similar conclusions. I then look briefly at the position in these in public debates on infrastructure, particularly what we might start to advocate for in terms of infrastructures of care. And I understand that these uh, public debates have already been very prominent in here in, in the US. The final part of the lecture considers where public debates may be enhanced by taking on some of the more critical aspects of the infrastructure and care literature in order to highlight issues of social justice, particularly the burdens of reproductive labour based on, based on women more generally and on marginalised people in different contexts. So first, what is infrastructure? Popular and political definitions of infrastructure see it as roads, rail, pipes, sewers, wires, substations, airports, buildings, and so on. But it's interesting when you look at dictionary definitions, um, how we're reminded that definitions of infrastructure have always been wider than this. 
about public works, about underlying foundations, about systems. Uh, the definition on the screen here is from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. The Oxford English Dictionary just defines infrastructure as a collective term for the subordinate parts of an undertaking, substructure or foundation. So no um, focus there on the material and physical, but talking about underlying structures and in the uh, definition on the screen that that kind of that in that focus on the public or the or the or the societal structures that that form the infrastructure that support uh, public and human life so such broader uses of the term infrastructure and the, particularly the need to see care as infrastructure came to the fore in in the us in debates around the bipartisan infrastructure framework but similar debates have been happening in the uk for many years on the need for a better care infrastructure I'm going to return to these public debates later on in the talk, but I wanted to first note that, that such debates have attempted very clearly to move beyond the idea that infrastructure equals great feats of engineering. Before going back to the, to the literature on infrastructure, I just wanted to look at the, the idea of nutrition itself being not just about food, but also being about care or more aptly nurture. Such ideas have long been present in public health nutrition, not least in the UNICEF framework on the determinants of child and maternal malnutrition, which has been amongst the most helpful tools for reminding us that nutrition is not just about food, it's about care practices, including breastfeeding, it's about caring environments, including proper sanitation and health services. In popular understanding, nurture is also seen as extending beyond food. Nurture is, seen being, is, nurture is seen as being about growth of plants, of animals, of people, somewhat related to food, but also related to the environment. But nurture is also about caring relationships, as in nurturing. Nurture is a form of care and therefore relates to various literatures on care. By thinking of nurture in the context of food and nutrition, I'm suggesting that we think more carefully about caring and nurturing relationships between parents and children, between childcare and school-based settings, thinking about the broader role of the state, also care for the natural environment, for decent food, for food cultures, and so on. All of these definitions can be part of a broader definition of nurture as care, which don't focus only on the, the relationship between food and nutrition. In social science work on care, particularly within critical geography, we find care understood as structures of support laid down over generations and often over distance. Care is about the blurring of bodily, emotional and affective relationships studied by those working, for example, on breastfeeding or on parent-child relationships. We see a sustained focus on the ethics of care. Who cares? Who does the caring? What happens in the absence of care or in cases of neglect? Can care even be detrimental? Can it even represent a form of violence in terms of overburdening or abusive care, or at least the sexual and domestic violence that happens in the context of many care situations? Geographical work on care also uses the metaphor of landscapes of care to help us integrate the human relationships of care with their physical and temporal dimensions. So over here on the left of the screen, Tronter and Fisher's quote is interesting because they were writing at the time of the development of the UNICEF framework in 1990, and they're already evoking some of the definitions of infrastructure in both popular discourse, but also later in academic writing that I'm going to turn to now. So they define care as the relationships and practices necessary to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. In academic writing, the literature on infrastructure is now vast, with many writing of an infrastructural turn to describe the kind of profound focus on infrastructure or infrastructures that this has led to. These perspectives on infrastructure have also been informed by related theory on assemblage or the very socio-materiality of life. Life is not neither social nor material, but the, the, the conjunction of the two. Most infrastructures, including, for example, water and sewage or the food system or food, are social material because they fully integrate complex natural and environmental systems with human organisation, with social and cultural ideas, so social and cultural relations, but most importantly, ideas. And infrastructures aren't merely built, 
but they require human relations for their access. They need constant investment and modification for their maintenance and their repair. Literature on the political economy of infrastructure has highlighted that who gets access to what is determined both by social relations, but also by entrenched ideologies ranging from gender to racism to ableism, but also to, to ideas such as financialization or neoliberalism. And the political economy of infrastructure raises questions of for whom is infrastructure designed or built or operated, but also for whom is infrastructure failing? I'm part of a consortium funded by the UK Research and Investment, which includes the African Centre for Cities, the University of Ghana, the Indian Institute of Human Settlements and the Colombo Urban Lab. We started out with a traditional definition of infrastructure and studying the lived experience of those who are living to various degrees on and off various infrastructure grids, water, electricity, um, sewage, transport and so on. And the project is, is taking place in, in five cities, uh, Colombo in Sri Lanka, Bengaluru in, uh, in South India, uh, Harare in Zimbabwe, Mossel Bay in South Africa, and Tamale in, in Ghana. And the project is trying to understand how much is the, the food and nutrition security of the most marginalized and how much is their broader well-being determined by their access to the grid. So when we started out, it was a very niche question of how food security depends on, for example, access to electricity. But the COVID crisis and subsequent food, fuel and financial crises have shown how important those questions are. So this is work carried out by our partners in Colombo in Sri Lanka, the Colombo Urban Lab. And they write, a sharp increase in the price of gas means that many households have switched cheaper alternative methods of cooking. Some houses have switched to kerosene, but now they find they cannot spare the time to stand in kerosene queues for long periods of time in order to acquire it. The wood fire stove was always also an option considered by households. However, given the spatial limitations in the houses, along with the strong fumes that are emitted from wood fire stoves, it was deemed unsuitable for most. The most popular choice then for many households is the rice cooker, with many cooking all their meals, including tea, their dinner, in the rice cooker. However, for houses with arrears and electricity bills from the COVID lockdown period, when they didn't have the ability to pay, a rice cooker represents a higher electricity bill, a luxury not many can afford. Some houses have seen a doubling in their electricity bill since they started to rely on the rice cooker for their meals. So very kind of powerfully illustrating the, the connection there between two different infrastructures, food and electricity, but also the dependence um, uh, of that people have on these infrastructures for their time use and for how they spend the day, which we'll talk about a bit more in this presentation. Because what we're finding is that in situations of chronic crises, um, punctuated by these processes of acute crises, who has to make up for infrastructural failings is shaped by intersectional difference. Women and children in particular, because become almost lived extensions of the grid, because it's they who are called on daily to make up for deficiencies in the grid in, in these various infrastructural systems. Uh, the quote here is from earlier work by Yaffa Trulove on water systems in Delhi, where she writes, women's bodies encounter different degrees of gendered hardships, physical labor and public shame that are shaped by their situated position within families, communities and class groups in the city. But when talking about infrastructure, we also need to get away from the idea of infrastructure as being about pipes or wires or things or even buildings. The feminist geographer Sarah Mary Hall picks up on this in interacting with Eric Kleinberg's best-selling book, which makes the case for social infrastructure and makes the case very powerfully. But Hall describes how in Kleinberg's work, social infrastructure is the physical places and organizations that shape the way that people interact. She asks, what and whose human labor maintains these infrastructures? And she reminds us how the majority of the care workforce are women, with black and minoritized ethnicity women, particularly on the line in providing care. In fact, according to Hall, it's exactly these relations that need to be seen as infrastructure, taking us away from that material and physical and built environment bias, 
She writes, feminist contributions have long argued the work involved in social reproduction is the labor that enables societies and economies to function. Social reproduction is thus in itself an infrastructure upon which to, upon which to build societies and economies, a complex network of people, practices, and politics, labor, love, and life. It does the work of maintaining and sustaining life worlds. So I'm gonna pause there just to summarize where we've got to so far. I talked about care being social and discursive and physical material relationships, and that there's a political economy of care, who cares, who gets cared for, who is neglected. I've also talked about infrastructures being also social and discursive and physical material relationships. And there's a political economy of infrastructure too, who has access, who fills the gaps, and for whom. Infrastructure is care, and there are infrastructures of care. And this returns us quite neatly to the debates that have been happening in public policy in America, where we see that there are many arguments that are trying to support an infrastructure of care. And we start to see why they are persuasive, but not so persuasive, I understand, for the funding to get into the final bill. Some of the arguments ranged against there being an infrastructure of care was to consider a it's ridiculous that care could be infrastructure. Infrastructure is clearly roads and cars and, and big engine stuff. Having heard the academic arguments, but even just remembering the original dictionary definition we started with, clearly infrastructure can be, indeed ethically ought to be, so much more. But as well as that social or ethical imperative, many of the policy briefings at the time of the infrastructure bill made a case for the economic ben benefits. I don't know the situation in the US, but in the UK and in Europe, in a times when we're still pursuing policies of fiscal austerity, day-to-day -day spending on social sectors is fiscally capped. While government investment in capital projects, you know, the big built infrastructure projects is allowed, because of the acknowledged return on investment, we have a policy of spending now for bigger returns later, which applies only to that, those kinds of built environment investments. But exactly the same arguments have been made for care infrastructure. If the argument to invest in physical infrastructure is to create jobs, then there, there are jobs created by investing in care infrastructure too. It also means that earlier investments in female education are not lost as women and some men, are lost to the workforce due to an inadequate care provision. In fact, policies such as paid parental leave, subsidized or free childcare, children's health, health visitors, and so on have well acknowledged benefits to children for both short term development and longer term outcomes. So we know that there are well evidenced impacts of, of all these types of care infrastructure on infant mortality. Um, lowering low birth weight of children or preterm births, raising breastfeeding rates, even reducing rates of pediatric head trauma, lowered rates of attention deficit disorder, lowered rates of obesity, better um, health outcomes over the life term and, and more. So this underlines the argument that as well as to be talking about an infrastructure of care, we ought to return to the idea of an infrastructure of nurture. In the UK, my colleague Leanne Sam and I, with others, just published a paper on the story of change in nutrition for my city, the small city of Brighton and Hove in the south coast of England. Now here something happens for child obesity rates to diverge markedly from the national averages. You can see here on the figure on the right, somewhere, sometime around 2008-2009, the, the top two lines show year six, which is um, around 10-11 year old children, in Brighton and Hove, the, where rates of um, child obesity were rising nationally, they started to drop. And we wanted to try and explain this by looking at the policy environment of what was happening for child obesity and healthy eating in, in Brighton. The council, what we found was that the council prioritized early years and children's centers over other forms of, of, of development locally, supporting breastfeeding support, when other local environments were cutting their support due to austerity policies that were um, uh, underway at the time in, in UK public spending. 
Healthy eating and public health teams worked across the council with the roads division and transport, with schools, promoting active travel, retail, promoting um, uh, better food environments, reduced advertising of, of uh, high fat, salt and sugar, and more. The city was the first to pioneer a voluntary sugar tax that became a mandatory national policy in, here in the UK, a soda tax. And an NGO, the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership, helped coordinate multi-sectorally. In a way, the city itself became an infrastructure of nurture. So returning to the idea of infrastructures of nurture, we need to see all aspects of nurture as having their own infrastructural dependencies. Food is a complex social natural infrastructure. Uh, the diagram here maps um, food flows uh, in, in the EU, but also very well illustrates this idea that food has its own complex infrastructure that we need to understand. So food is a complex social natural infrastructure, but early years provision, as I just argued, is also infrastructure. And healthcare and sanitation are infrastructure too. Now that's not new if we understand the UNICEF framework, but we also need to be reminded that people and things and ideologies and the system that support them are infrastructure too. So work in public health, for example, focuses on the infrastructure of support that needs to be there to support frontline workers, sometimes against a background of quite severe constraints in terms of their training, supervision, community resources, but also, as some workers found, discrimination that they may experience within the community itself. Um, and this is the work of a, a doctoral student of, of ours here at IDS, Apana John, who published work on the systems of support needed for frontline health workers in India. But we're reminded that people suffer not just in the absence of infrastructure, but also from poor infrastructure, from maladaptive infrastructure, and from various forms of slow violence, which are perpetuated throughout state public infrastructure. Work in critical nutrition, for example, has pointed out that public health interventions, particularly those working against the grain of local culture and ignorant of local socioeconomic conditions, can do more to stigmatize and burden women than they help. Women are seen as walking windows of opportunity for optimal baby growth. Wider identities were raised in discussing whether they are or aren't of reproductive age. In some health programs, they face cuts to welfare if their children don't attend school or health clinics, uh, as in the conditionalities one gets in terms of conditional cash transfers in many Latin American countries. And in nearly every public health setting I've worked in, Women are burdened with more care burdens by seen as an untapped army of volunteers to run women's groups and to support house to house counselling, for example, for infant and young child feeding practices. This is beautifully captured by the ethnographer Bronwyn Gillespie, who's written about this in her ethnography of nutrition programmes in the Peruvian Andes. And so I just have to move my screen share icon so I can read this. So Bronwyn writes, the state targets women for their domestic and reproductive qualities, locating them at the center of what Locke and Gwen have called a sized domestic child rearing sphere. In Peru, state girls in health still rely on women's unpaid work, reifying un unequal gen gender relations, suggesting women's time is free and obligatory activities tied to health and education, such as meetings and trainings have greatly increased. They now manoeuvre within a double bind situation where scarce resources have to meet not just food needs, which are now regulated by the post, the, the, this is the local health clinic, to in, include increased animal protein, but the increasing costs related to education, usually financed through selling animals. While they now have less labour on hand to help them with production as their children are in school. So balancing these responsibilities is most problematic for women in vulnerable situations, those who are poorest, landless, isolated, or suffering from domestic abuse. They're less likely to be able to meet state expectations and more likely to suffer the corresponding label of irresponsibility. I'm just gonna pause there because I'm missing a, a summary slide. So, um, Apologies, but I'm just going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation and bring that slide back. <laughs> 
and then try to summarize. Okay. How's that? Um, I don't see it, Nick. Oh, there you go. There you go. There. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, just to summarize where we've got to, I'm arguing that um, infrastructure of care or infrastructures of care have become a strong part of public policy discourse. Um, in the States, they were a big part of the um, bipartisan infrastructure bill. And there's been many debates here in the UK and in Europe for a long time on um, considering infrastructures of care, but they're not always in that language. But clearly there's a kind of normative um, and common sense um, need to, to view these systems of, of infrastructures of care. So that's making the case for um, infrastructures of care as being infrastructures. But what I've also tried to argue in this presentation is the need to think through infrastructure by using these um, social science um, new perspectives on infrastructure that have, have um, dominated social science in, in the last decade, so much so that in some disciplines, particularly geography, but also urban studies and coming into anthropology and sociology as well, uh, many have talked about this infrastructural turn. If we're going to be thinking through infrastructure, then we need to think of the political economy of infrastructure. We need to think about what is the gendered and intersection, intersectional nature of care infrastructure. Is there an infrastructure of violence? What, is the, the, what are the gaps and consequences of, of systems of infrastructure that are failing? But we also need to be drawing on this idea of infrastructure as assemblage, about pe being about people, relationships, ideologies. So we need to consider people, workforce, families, systems of support for people in working in care infrastructures, but also for individuals and families providing care. We need to understand ideologies. So what ideologies are driving infrastructures? What's the state providing? What's left to the individual? But what other ideologies are affecting what kinds of infrastructure people are dealing with on a day to day basis, which might include racism, patriarchy or border economic um, ideologies, which might have included in the past structural adjustment or nowadays different forms of neoliberalism or statism. And something that I've not talked about in this, this presentation, but is an obvious link um, both into um, thinking about nutrition and nurture, but also food systems more broadly, is the idea of infrastructure as, as being a social material relationship between human systems and natural systems. And so what are the interactions with the natural world? And just a, a reminder of some of the earlier um, summary that we need to think about care as this social and discursive and physical um, relationships. There's a political economy of care, who cares, who gets cared for. Infrastructure is also a social and discursive and physical relationship. There's a political economy of infrastructure, who has access, who fills the gaps and for whom. If infrastructure is care, there are infrastructures of care. Nutrition equals nurture, which also equals care. And there are infrastructures of nurture that we need to think about in terms of these perspectives on political economy and equity and justice as well. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I just wanted to thank some of the people who've um, been um, influential in, in bringing together the work that I've presented today, partly through the Living Off Grid and Infrastructure Collaboration, but also another network I'm with, with colleagues in Latin America. So people at the University of Cape Town, the African Center for Cities, University of Ghana, Indian Institute of Human Settlements, the Colombo Urban Lab, Universidad de Antioquia, University of Peru and Keti, Caetana Heredia, Universidad Nacional San Cristobal de Humanga, and uh, other colleagues in Central America, Jorge Vasquez, Miguel Or Orozco, and Matia Ibarra. So thanks very much for having me today, and I'm looking forward to hearing questions as well. Thank you, Nick, so much for the fantastic presentation.
an overview of, of this key piece of work that you're doing. Thank you again. I'd like to open it, the floor up for questions. Um, I believe you can raise your hand or you can put a question in the Q&A. I prefer to hear uh, people. <laughs> we can start with Anne. She has her hand raised. Anne, go ahead. Um, and introduce yourself, Anne, who oh, you are. I'm mm -hmm. Anne Barnhill. I'm a faculty member at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, and I work on um, ethics of food and agriculture, ethics of public health. Um, so I was interested in a number of different things that you said. Um, one first question I want to ask you is, how do you think about care and rights? So like human rights. So Jess and I, <clears throat> excuse me, are involved in this project, which is like bringing a human rights lens and approach to think about food systems, you know, public health, nutrition. So I'm just wondering, how do you think about that? Because care, you know, is just a very different frame than thinking about rights and the rights of the individual individuals. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. That's great, thank you. Um, Jess, are we gonna take a few questions or do you want me to? I think you can do one by one. If we start to get more in there, we can take more, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is interesting to me, partly because I've also, um, as Jess um, said at the beginning, that a lot of my work's been on also on, on nutrition equity, nutrition justice. Um, and a lot of the kind of you know, normative work on, on nutrition and, and food systems also, has also been from a rights perspective. And sometimes we um, interact with people coming from a more kind of legalistic rights background. Um, and they're asking, you know, all this talk about justice and equity, what's the kind of, what's the basis for it? And I think to me, it's drawing on social science perspectives and, and sometimes kind of political philosophy perspectives on, on on justice and equity but also on care just gives us a different um cut a different kind of analytical cut through some of these thorny issues that we're dealing with so of course any of the um topics that i i, I talked about today could be dealt with from a, a rights perspective um but my my point of 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 going to the literatures on on infrastructure and going to the literatures on care is that they give us a, a different analytical cut through things which we which we don't obtain from a kind of more um, legalistic rights language or even from a kind of more activist rights language um, they allow us to think about the world slightly differently um, so in terms of of care um, thinking about the kind of very relationality of of care which is about human relations it's about the kind of um, you know, parent-child dyads, it's about the, the state and society, um, but it's also about what ideologies are driving different systems of care. Um, and to me, I think that's leading to a slightly different set of questions than what one might have arrived at through a rights perspective. And for me, then, that's why it's a kind of productive um, exercise to start to think through these different literatures and, and see what types of different questions um, they, they help us to ask. They might arrive at the same uh, point, sometimes they often do, um, but sometimes they can unearth different systems of, of human organization or, or, or various kind of influences on that human organization that we wouldn't otherwise have, have been thinking about. Great, thanks Nick. There's a question from someone anonymous. Thanks for the interesting presentation. Do you have any thoughts on the role of special interest groups in defining what counts as being worth caring about? <laughs> um, I, I I feel like there's 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 perhaps a kind of that's a leading question. Maybe something I'm I'm not familiar with in in U.S. politics, but mm. um, yeah, I I think um, as Jess knows, kind of a lot of our work has been also about the um, the the ethics of, of of industry lobbying in the wider food system um, that was something very kind of dear to my my heart when I was 
um, participating in the, the UN Food System Summit last year and kind of just seeing the kind of different um, and very subtle ways in which um, special interest groups can actually have quite a, a profound effect on, 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 um, on public discourse and, and, and public fora where, where we're debating kind of different options for the food system. Um, so I think um, in, I, I don't know enough about the US situation to, to, to comment, but I think at, at a global level, um, I think defining what we care about is also defining what public policy is about. And I think again, the, the reason for kind of looking into these, these perspectives coming from geography and, and elsewhere on care is that they actually start to look at very different um, sets of relations that one might do if, if one's thinking only about food systems being about um, agro, uh, agro food production systems, value chains and so on. Again, they kind of bring in different relationships. They bring in the kind of personal, they bring in the intimate, emotional and effective um, uh, you know, parts of our lives that, that, that normally aren't seen to matter. Um, but if we're to see infrastructure as being about what, what do we need to get from day to day, um, there's going to be a kind of almost, I don't know, a masculinist focus of public policy that says that what we need from day to day is the stuff that gets us to work. That's why infrastructure is seen as roads and cars and railways and planes. But actually what we need from, from day to day to function in everyday life includes these systems of care. Um, and I, again, I think that's the reason why we need to kind of broaden what gets onto the policy agenda and I think some of these perspectives can help us to do that. So it's a very kind of roundabout way of answering your question, because I, I feel like there's something there that I, I wasn't quite catching, but uh, I hope that helps. And maybe if you, you want to put some more in the, the, the type box, then uh, we can, uh, I can speak further. Okay, next question from Khadija Ferryman. Nice to see you, Khadija. Hi there, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you well. Great. Um, thanks so much for the uh, fascinating talk. Um, I have a question that's sort of related to the, the previous question and your response. Um, so as you said, you know, the, the notion, uh, kind of expanded notion of infrastructure is one that sort of made its way into um, social science. And sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I am um, core faculty at the Berman Institute of Bioethics and also um, assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the School of Public Health here at Johns Hopkins and also a anthropologist, uh, an anthropologist by training. Um, so there, and so there's been this notion, um, at least in some of the kind of social science, um, treatment of infrastructure of this idea of um, infrastructures being uh, and specifically these sort of expanded notions of infrastructure being uh, vulnerable to capture by uh, special interests by those in power uh, governments etc and I know you just briefly mentioned um, the Brighton example of the kind of infrastructure of, of care and nurture that you um, uh, we're investigating and, you know, it sounds like was effective. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about if that's a concern, if you have sort of done research and identified um, a an expanded uh, infrastructure of care and nurture that seems to have um, positive public health outcomes, if there's a worry or concern about that infrastructure being subject to capture by the state, by, I don't know, food companies who sort of are looking at these networks and, and figuring out how to use them to market, I don't know, what have you, even though you said, right, you've, you've um, uh, part of this was, um, uh, you know, some interventions against, against marketing, but I'm just wondering if that's something, if that's a concern, if you will. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think I'm kind of understanding the question a bit more now. So thank, thanks so much for explaining that. I think, I mean, what we've seen in Brighton, we've been working quite closely with the, the public health team here to um, to support some of the work that's, that's going on here. And, and recently, um, one of the um, proposals that went before the, the local administration here was to ban high fat salt sugar advertising on council owned transport um advertising so 
um, we have a lot of bus stops here in town and each of these bus stops has a kind of um, advertising hoarding. Um, and nowadays, increasingly, that advertising hoarding will be a, um, a you know, a big LCD screen showing adverts. Um, and so uh, one of the things we, we did or, the, or the, the local public health team did that, that we were advising one was to kind of actually just think about children's um, transport routes um, in and out of school and just to kind of see you know the, the way that children were, were going themselves they'll either be walking or they'll, they'll be getting the bus um, and the kind of um, advertising they're exposed to on those routes and so there was a, a proposal that was put in front of the, the administration here to ban that that advertising because that had been successful actually in, in London um, now, what was fascinating, because, you know, you can argue that this was a, um, you know, attempt to kind of um, further improve the infrastructure of nurture here, um, was that as soon as that proposal was put on the table, um, a lobbying group um, kind of popped up and managed to um, get a paper in front of some of the decision makers in the council um, saying, you know, basically quite a kind of slick um, presentation and um, basically saying that you know the measures that you're about to put in place um, not only are they kind of you know the, there's no evidence that they they work in terms of having an impact on on children's healthy eating but actually there's good evidence that will show that this will be very detrimental to the the council's revenues and, and here's some evidence on that and here's where it's gone wrong in other countries in, in other municipalities uh, and so on um, now this is kind of still um, being there's been just a change in administration um, in in the last uh, few days here actually so this is kind of a very live issue and it'll be kind of go back in front of the decision makers soon um, but what I was just amazed at was that you know this is quite a we're quite a small city here um, this was you would have thought this is quite a small um, uh, piece of public decision making about local infrastructure um, but how quickly and how smoothly the, the lobbying operation kind of um, uh, flew into action there to try and influence local policy and, and, and actually had a kind of um, had a, 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 an effect that's, that's probably going to be overturned, but is actually kind of um, still having effects now. And so I think, yeah, every, every infrastructure can be um, uh, can be um, party to um to nefarious interests or conflicts of interests um i think that's um true of 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 the food industry of course but i think also other aspects of of the care industry are um there's a lot of money um if if they're public infrastructures there's going to be a lot of money involved there's going to be a lot of actors trying to um to um bend the the, the kind of political will to their interest as well so I think this is kind of it's not something it's something I've had a direct experience of here in, in Brighton it's not something I've um uh integrated into my um to my writing on infrastructure of nurture yet but I'm I'm really pleased that you've kind of alerted me to this and I'm going to have a, a further look at it uh, as a result so thank you okay so we have a lot of questions coming in I'm going to take two from the Q&A, Nick, and you can probably see them as well, but I'll read them for the group and then um, you can also kind of look at them because they're pretty heavy questions. Um, this is from Devi, who I think you know is a PhD student here at SAIS. Um, thanks for the presentation. How is a country's welfare state hindering or enabling this infrastructure of care. I assume this relates to the political ideology as well. And then uh, one other question, then we'll go to the ones in the room. Um, this is from John Schaefer. Hi, John. Thank you for this great presentation. I'm curious about where you think levers of political struggle exist or ought to exist in this framing of infrastructures of care. Systems of care, as you mentioned, are grounded on hugely unequal control of flows of material goods and infrastructural nodes, production, transport, distribution, etc. Do you have any thoughts on strategies of democratizing such systems? And then we'll come yeah, back to the one, the live questions. Those are two two great questions. So thank you very much. And hi, David. It's nice to 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 mm -hmm. see you or to to hear from you. Um, yeah. So I. 
I mean, this is interesting for me because I'm, you know, I'm a bit of a, a, a statist at, at heart. I think that actually in making the um, the argument for infrastructure of care, we're making a kind of normative argument saying that there, there ought to be infrastructure. This shouldn't um, this shouldn't be left to to individuals, particularly kind of families that are already marginalised and suffering from um, a lack of resources. There needs to be some kind of state provision there. Um, but what the reason why I included that example from um, Peru um, and we, you know with the University um, of um, uh, Heredia in in in, um, in Lima and um, colleagues in. Uh, Ayacucho in, in Peru, we're doing kind of further work on this area and we're kind of looking at the, the impact of uh, Juntos, which is, is the kind of um, conditional cash transfer program that's been very famous in Peru and, and seen as very successful. But um, it it's, has an impact on, on people that's, um, that's a kind of, as, as I was trying to say, it's almost a kind of mal infrastructure at the same time. So it's providing cash, it's providing advice, um, but it's also a great burden on, on people in terms of the expectations on the way that they're singled out for kind of um, further um, attention by the state, on the way that they're stigmatised, on, on the way that local health workers think that they have a right to um, uh, tell people how to bring up their children and so on. So I think to me as a kind of, you know, um, as a statist to kind of see that that impact that this can have on marginalized people, further stigmatizing them, further adding to their burdens is actually quite interesting for me as well. And it's kind of been um, uh, um, a, a kind of wake up call for me that, you know, that my, I need to kind of examine my own status in there. On the, on the other hand though, I think, you know, one, I, one of the slides, I didn't comment on it, but I kind of showed the, you know, the, um, paid parental leave policy of various OECD countries. And you see the huge differences between, between the states, which according to that graph, doesn't have any paid parental leave as far as I'm aware. And other countries where you see 36, 42, 52 uh, weeks of parental leave that's paid in some countries paid at 90% of, 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 of standard salaries. In many countries now that's split between uh, female and male carers as well and again that's a different type of, of welfare ideology which which will clearly have impacts on 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 children on in terms of their I mean it has um, well evidence impacts on children and the development and their and their outcomes later on in life as well so I think we need to have that discussion about well that welfare ideologies and we need to be critical about it um, but it certainly needs to be part of this discussion of infrastructures of care. And that was my, my kind of purpose of stressing that it's about people, it's about resources, but it's about ideologies as well. And so that's why I think we, that, that was a, a brilliant question from, from Davey. So thank you very much. Um, John's question, um, political struggles. I, I find this really interesting as well, because I, I wish I could remember the name of the, the, there was a guy that came to present to us about development in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu in, in South India, uh, which Tamil Nadu is, 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 is a state that's um, done very well in terms of, of social and, and health outcomes. It's one of the kind of um, wealthier Indian states, but it's also one, much, one of the, the kind of much better pre performers in terms of nutrition and health and other social outcomes as well. And he was describing how he'd studied a, a village over, over many years where people's demands had shifted over time. They'd kind of, they were making demands on the state. And most of those demands were about infrastructure. It started off with, you know, we want to have a, a temple built, but then it was, we want to have school. We want to have a health post. We want to have roads here. And many of people's demands on the state there have been framed always around infrastructure. Now, if you think about other contexts where people are making demands on the state it's often also about basic needs they're not always framed in terms of infrastructure so when people um, have protests around around food or when the, when we saw in the kind of the this 2007-2008 um, food price crisis there were many food riots at the time and again these are kind of people actually 
um, through their own resistance, through their own um, forms of protest, in some cases in terms of riots, again making demands on the state in terms of infrastructure. So I, my feeling is that actually this kind of democratization of, of demands for infrastructure is, is already happening. Um, another example is in, is in South Africa, where people were, um, when they were annoyed with the state for giving them, um, not putting in proper systems of sanitation, they were taking the, um, the portable toilets that they'd been given for their sanitation needs and throwing them on the highway and blocking the highway. And again, this was a kind of set of demands about infrastructure that people were taking into their, their own hands. So I don't think there needs to be necessarily a strategy of, of democratizing this, because I think people will take this into their own hands, they'll make their own demands. Um, but what we might need to do is, is, as social researchers and public health researchers is to help people conceptualize what they're asking for in terms of infrastructure. So demanding an infrastructure of care. I don't see people on the streets necessarily um, protesting about the lack of childcare or the lack of um, paid parental leave. But by framing it as infrastructure, framing it as, as essential basic needs of society might help people to frame those demands better in front of the state. Great. Thanks, Nick. We have a question from an audience, Caitlin. Feel free to yeah. turn I, on your video. Oh, or... good. Yeah, I can see I'm talking at the top of the good. screen. Um, thank you so much for a really fascinating presentation. It, it was lovely to hear the word assemblage again. And um, I think you made a very strong case for why socio-materialist frameworks are helpful in, in thinking through in infrastructures of care. Um, so I was also very interested in your talk of infrastructures of care and breastfeeding. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about what those infrastructures look like in some of the different contexts that you are studying. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure everyone in this Zoom room knows that breastfeeding is not free. Um, things like increased uh, water consumption, increased food consumption, that's not free. Breast pumps aren't free. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear how you're applying this framework to thinking through the, the different contexts that you study with this particular uh, focus. Yeah, thank you. So I think, um, I mean, you've kind of, you've, you've, basically said some of it already in that it, it's a complex system um, that needs to be in place to support people to to breastfeed um, and it's a system that's kind of arrayed against another system which is you know decades of um, influence of, of formula production companies to try and convince people to do otherwise so the the system you need to be in place needs to be, um, you know, lactation counsellors or house to house counsellors, um, giving people advice about early early initiation, latching on, um, weaning, and, and 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 complementary feeding, and so on. So that that needs to be there, and it's it's very hard. To, we've we've got colleagues here who study this. Um, different forms of um, behavioral communication and and looking for example at the the role of new technologies and in most cases it seems very hard to deliver that purely virtually there needs to be some kind of um, almost day-to-day -day contact between people and, and and health workers as well to enable that particularly at times when when breastfeeding is, is difficult or when people are beginning and are having difficult like difficulty latching on and so on so that needs to be there as well. So that's already kind of thinking about the kind of um, relationship of, of, of people in terms of the infrastructure. But those those people then need their supporting structures. Um, the, the 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 work that I um, showed in one of the slides by um, Aparna John and colleagues, um, where we've looked at kind of the um, support structures needed for frontline workers in terms of supervision. But it's also material things like job aids. Do people have the right resources? Are they appropriately um, developed for the local context. If you're talking about dietary diversity, have, has it been kind of varied according to local food groups available locally and so on? So there's, again, there's another part of the, the infrastructure there that needs to be built in. But then lastly, there's the, the ideology because, you know, all this takes sustained work. I mean, I've worked in a lot of projects where donors or even sometimes um, NGOs who are delivering um, some of the, these, these systems of support, 
say, well, what's the what's the exit strategy here? You know, what's the how sustainable is this? Um, how many years do we need to keep doing this for? And the answer is that you need to keep doing it for as many years as people continue to have children, because people will always need support in this. Um, so there's, there needs to be an ideology of, of, of care there. And I guess that kind of relates to, to Debbie's question, that you need an ideology that, that the state will be there to support people in their childcare needs, um, so long as people are having children. And so there are ideologies there about how, how public um, health is um, integrated into systems of health, how health is paid for, whether it's um, uh, it's, it's an insurance-based model, whether it's private public-based models, and so on. So ideologies are a key part of that kind of care infrastructure around breastfeeding support as well. Great. I don't see any more questions. Thanks, Nick. Maybe just in their last two minutes, can you just tell us about this high-level panel of experts report? Like, what is what are these reports? What's this theme, and and why is it important in the context of everything that you've been talking about today? <laughs> in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you promised you wouldn't ask me that. <laughs> so yeah, this um, the high-level panel of experts for the um, Committee on Food Security. There's this, this is report number. 18 i think um jess you were the the chair of report number uh, i can't remember now 12, 12 or something <laughs> yeah so these these reports come out every year they're commissioned actually by member states who are members of the commit uh, committee on food security and they decide the kind of forward agenda of what's going to be um reported on over the next few years and you know a, a call goes out to assemble a panel of experts um so inequality in food systems is one of the um one of the uh, topics that was agreed um, uh, about two or three years ago by the by the member states of the Committee on Food Security. Um, to me, it's it's super important. Obviously, I would <laughs> I would say that. Um, but we're at we're at a point where I mean, this this it feels you know, Jess, you'll know this as well. It feels like there's there's hardly another day goes by without another major report or publication on on food systems. Um, and yet we seem to be almost failing in, in dealing with one of the central issues, which is you know, what the Sustainable Development Goals promise to do, which is to leave no one behind. And yet we've never looked at that centrally. Why are so many people being left behind? And, and who are the people that are being left behind by the food system? How do we, how do we distinguish this based on, on people's social position and identity? identity and how does that social position and identity and and the often the intersectional discrimination that they face how does that position them in the food system um so i was saying to jess earlier that this we've um, our chair pavani shankar is is working on the final final draft today before it goes off to the secretariat to be to be published um, so we'll have more to say about it very, very soon and, and look out for the publication, which should be um, around the 14th of June. So, so very soon. Really well, exciting. Looking forward to reading it. Well, thank you, Nick, so much for spending uh, time with us at the Berman. And I know we're going to take about a 15 minute break and you're going to come back on and have a chat with the Berman Fellows. So thank you again, and thanks everyone for joining today. And it was great seeing you, Nick. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.